Hey there YouTube, this is SGM4306 back with another video. So this time we're actually looking at a package I received uh, from my friend Chad. And as you can see open here, this is just re repackaged in something. So anyway, uh, just thought you guys would be interested. I printed out these little uh, keychain razor blade utility things I found on Thingiverse. And they're sort of, mm, I don't know, the idea is good, but... The mechanism sometimes doesn't work so great. But anyway, I'm just going to use that to actually cut the tape open. And let's see what he's packed. Now, this is a repair for him. Um, and uh, basic backstory, uh, he's a musician and he uses mini discs uh, in order to record his music. And he recently tried to fire his up, and it did not work, unfortunately. So, let's see. <clears throat> so this is his unit here. It's an MZN707, uh, and it's a NetMD player. And uh, he basically said, I believe, something to the effect, uh, it'll turn on, um, it'll try to read a disc, and it just will eventually time out and shut off, and it just can't ever read the disc. Anyway, yeah, so I guess uh, first thing to do is let's throw a battery in and uh, check it. One thing I already noticed is it's missing two screws on the, the top lid. That shouldn't affect anything, though. We'll take a quick look inside. The read-write magnetic head doesn't look bent or anything. It looks actually pretty clean inside. So I don't see any issues with that. There might be a little bit of dust, but... I've seen far worse. Um, but anyway, uh, let me grab a AA battery and make sure it turns on. Okay, I can see, looks like the segments are lit. Okay, yeah, so I did a little bit more testing and I cleaned everything. I went over the contacts with IPA. It's still doing the exact same thing. None of the buttons work, but it will actually read and load the disk. Everything that that point uh, works. It's a little bit dusty. It needs a little bit of cleaning, but I'll worry about getting this up and running first. So I have a box full of old mini disk uh, broken parts and whatnot. So I'm just going to take, I actually have a spare uh, 707, the neat little Thunderbolt. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to stick this on and see if it'll start working. Um with this new front board. And if it does, then I'm going to dismantle this to see if there's anything obvious. And if not, he can have, I can uh, swap his front for the display button board on this guy. And let's just see. So it's loading once again, it is reading. Now, the buttons on this board clearly are working. Uh, there we go. And it is playing. And all the buttons on this board are working. You can just shut that off. So yeah, it's definitely the front board. Let's dismantle this front board and see if there's anything. I didn't notice any rips or anything in the ribbon, which would be my first guess. Okay, um, let's just see, yeah, don't want to lose, there's a little spring for the uh, center button there. I mean, it is kind of dirty on the back, but the bond itself looks fine. This is basically, the ribbon is, um, is like thermally bonded with a conductive adhesive, I believe, to the front board here. I mean, it looks like there's a tiny little blip or something going on. Sorry about that. Uh, something right here. And the way that this communicates, I believe it, there is actually a controller, so it's all digital. Uh, but I believe the button presses may or may not be like a resistive ladder. Some of the older um, 
MD portables use a similar method to that, but this could also be all encoded digitally with this controller. So this might be a purely digital uh, interface. So obviously if one wire doesn't work, then the whole thing doesn't work depending on what wire is damaged. Yeah, there is possibly like a bend or something in the ribbon right here, but as far as I can see, all the conductors look fine. Now, it is entirely possible that just this board just happened to die I, for some unknown reason. It happens not very often, but uh, let's just give it one final test. Let's see if I can just get it to play. Nope, like none of the buttons are responding, so I think this board is actually dead. So what I'm going to do is unscrew the good board. I'm just going to swap it all out for his original parts. Uh, just the front controller board will be new, because this one apparently is damaged. Um, and what's weird though is the LCD works just fine, it's just none of the buttons work. It's absolutely nothing obvious. I bet you it's like a single hairline fracture on the ribbon or something weird going on. Because the board itself doesn't look corroded. Uh, nothing. If it were anything up with the buttons, it would be like one or two of the buttons not working, but all of them don't work. So that's just like really suspicious. But the LCD is still good, so obviously something's getting through. Anyway. So one important thing, make sure your hold switch is in the right position. Uh, otherwise, when you go to flip it, you are going to uh, break the switch. So before screwing anything down, make sure it's in the correct position to the plastic outer part. And even flip it a few times just to make sure. And I'm just going to get a screw started so it doesn't try to pop out on me. Okay, so this is all good to go. I am going to stick this back in. Kind of have to align it correctly from the top. Get the ribbon back in. And I just like to give it a quick test before I screw everything back together. Now, he is missing uh, two screws, so I'm going to dig around in my little bag with my little box of mini disc parts and get those screws and they were noticeably on the bottom where the ribbon is so that kind of lends some credence to my um, theory that maybe there was um, damage to the there we go some damage to the ribbon like a microscopic little tear or something um, because that's kind of a critical part if the screws on the top side were missing that would be less uh, likely to have damage. And there we go. So run the battery and do one last test. Um, I'm going to test this more thoroughly with a mix of other discs to make sure that the laser itself is still good. So menu button works. It brings up the menu. I can cancel. I can play. It's playing now. I can skip. I mean the way that it skips how quickly it does tells me that the laser is still good uh, because it's pretty quick. Um, if your laser is dying, uh, what you're going to notice is when you go to skip like towards the middle or the end of the disc from the front, it's going to take a long time and it'll be stuck at zero, 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 zero. And it'll take, you know, a good 15, 20 seconds for it to actually read the track. And another thing is if you go from, you know, the beginning or the end of the disc, um, you might notice it'll play like the beginning tracks, but not the end ones or vice versa. Uh, but this one seems to, yeah, when I just tell it to go back and forth, it has absolutely no trouble and it just starts playing immediately. So we're just going to shut this off. I think we are good. Um, I think we're good to go. Okay, so I found another... Sorry, just setting headphones aside. I was just testing it. Now, obviously, it would play, but I need to make sure that it would actually, you know, produce audio. And it kind of doesn't. It It's weird. If I press down on here, I can hear kind of a muffled sound. So it could possibly be this audio amp chip was messed up. 
or it could be the soldering. Um, soldering looks okay, sort of. I might reflow those just as a matter of course, but it could very likely be this amp chip. Something's wrong with it. And when I was taking it apart, I found another issue. Uh, I hadn't noticed. I hadn't looked too closely at it, but uh, you might see the problem. <laughs> the read right head was ripped. So yeah, probably, um, I don't know, with wiggling or something. I don't know. It looks like it's sheared off completely. And I definitely did not do that. So uh, yeah, so obviously that's going to need to be resoldered. Um, but I think one issue at a time. So we'll fix that next. Uh, but I need to get this audio working. So let me grab the board from my other 707. And um, that one, I think it might have had some issues. But um, I'm going to stick it in here and uh, see if that'll fire up with this laser and everything. And I believe I have a spare overwrite head if I can't solder the ribbon on this. Uh, but I'm going to do a big no-no, which is removing this without soldering the uh, blob on there, but it should be fine. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, we're going to have to work on this some more. I thought that's all that was wrong with it was the uh, button board, but looks like this has at least three issues with it. <laughs> anyway, that's the way things go. This actually makes for more interesting repairs, so let's get on that. Okay, so this was my backup board. I can't remember what was wrong with this. I should start writing, putting post-it notes and writing. But uh, this has no power. Um, it just won't turn on, even on AC or nothing. But it does have a uh, headphone jack or a headphone amp chip. And I believe uh, when I got this, this did actually work. Uh, it just had a really bad um, corrosion on the terminal. And it worked for, I think, like a week. And then it just stopped powering on so I think there must be some other corrosion but I could at the very least pull that chip off I'm pretty sure that chip worked last I got this to turn on here's his board what I'm going to try to do is it's kind of in a precarious spot I'm trying I'm going to try to use the hot air gun and just reflow this and gently tap it down put a little bit of flux on there uh, to see if I can get it to reflow and I'm going to do that with the hot air gun on I'll start at like maybe 250 on low uh, airspeed just so that I don't uh, damage anything adjacent to that chip. But we're going to give that a try. Hopefully uh, it's just a bad soldering job because like I said, when I pressed it, it did actually kind of very low volume. I started working, so I have a feeling maybe it might be the soldering. Uh, I might pull out the microscope and inspect it very carefully, but uh, that'll be a pain. So I'm just going to try to... Uh, reflow this first and then I'm gonna if I have to then I'll get this under the microscope inspect every single solder joint okay so I'm back so I reflowed I basically put a lot of this Kester uh, liquid flux all around the chip I uh, turned up my iron to about let's see what is it 320 now and wind speed or air speed was about four and a half to five, so I wouldn't blow away parts. And I just went at it and I used this little poking tool to like slightly nudge it. And when I, I did actually end up looking under the microscope, it was hard to get the shot because I had to hold it at an angle so I can see the um, this is a leadless chip. And the way you tell if it's solder is you kind of have to look at an angle to see if the little tiny bits of metal along the side actually connect to the board. And the side, this side looked a little funny. So I, um, you know, reflowed everything and let's see if it'll play. So I don't know if you can hear that, but yeah, it's playing. Uh, volume gets loud. It sounds good. It sounds like, you know, the album that I recorded should sound. So I think the audio is fixed now. So it just had some dry solder joints, and that might have been exacerbated by the fact that Sony put the amp chip right near a point of like high mechanical stress from you inserting and removing the jacks. So basically just needed to be resoldered. Now let's deal with the overwrite head ribbon is clearly ripped. So obviously it's not going to work until we patch that. And so, so far we're two out of three. So let's uh, see if I can get the uh, overwrite ribbon fixed and then we'll be three for three. Okay, so you can see why I didn't really notice uh, before when I took it apart. Um, 
the ribbon was it was probably some adhesive that was on here it was taped flat and it broke right at the edge exactly where you'd expect it to right at the edge uh, between the metal frame parts where it actually bends so that's going to be resoldered so there's actually two things i can do i can scrape off the conductor here and either do the same for here and solder bodge solder these that's sort of a weak joint though uh, better would be to use very thin uh, stranded wire to go over to the back and remove this little tail then that's unnecessary um, or if you have a just another replacement, which I don't believe I do. I'll check in a second, but you could just replace the entire ribbon. But then once you remove this screw, you have to recalibrate the um, like the positioning of the overwrite head. So it's exactly over the laser as, as well as you can get it. Um, so I'd rather not touch any of that because that's actually pretty finicky. I've done that repair before and it's a lot of tweaking and stuff like that. I'd rather not do. So what I'm going to try is scraping off and soldering little bits of wires and then just bridging them straight to here, uh, adding a little bit of slack so that I can actually, you know, it can open and close without possibly breaking that. So first thing that I'm gonna do is uh, remove the old tail uh, that's just sitting here doing nothing now. So for that, I'm just going to turn on my iron and increase the temp to about 700 or something like that Fahrenheit uh, because these are on kind of beefy pads and we're going to uh, just heat them both up and pull there's a little bit adhesive here but the heating will actually pull that off pretty easily and there we go so we're left with a lot of solder <laughs> I'm gonna remove all that extra solder just leave a little bit on the pads Clean this up with some IPA, get them ready to solder. I'm going to find a ribbon that I can actually use to solder, but uh, before I do that, in the meantime, I'm going to try and carefully scrape um, this little bit of the ribbon that's left, scrape off the just the outer portion, leaving um, exposed copper that I can uh, put some flux on and tin and create some solder joints. Okay, so what I ended up using was this X-Acto blade, very sharp and kind of short. So when you get your fingers, you actually have very fine control over this. And I just leaned my finger against the side and scraped lightly over and over again. And eventually the, uh, the conductive or the uh, insulative part just kind of flaked off. And I only did two little spots. I didn't go crazy with it because if you go crazy, you actually go right through the copper and then you have to cut that bit back and then start again further up. But anyway, you can see right here, sorry about that. You can see I, I put a little flux and I pre tin them so they're ready to go. So these are ready to accept uh, new wiring. So now I just got to find suitable wire. I have solid core wire and that'll work short term, uh, but long term as you keep opening and closing the door, it'll eventually create like a stress fracture and the wire will break and then you have to replace that wire anyway. So what I'm actually looking for is similar to the wire that's used in flexible headphone cords where it's um, sort of uh, enamel coated, multi-stranded, really thin wire that is made to flex back and forth over and over without breaking. That is ideal in this case. I'm going to have to find me some. I have boxes of wiring, but most of them are much too large for this or kind of unsuitable. So give me a second. I'm going to look to see if I have any of that type of wiring or I might just sacrifice a cheap pair of headphones to, to get a, a length of that wire. So give me one second. Okay, it took me a while to find. I have these old earbuds that the cord actually broke off from, and it has that kind of enamel-coated uh, multi-strand wire. I'm just going to actually uh, cut this back and use a length of this since I don't think I'm ever going to use these anyway. <laughs> so let's just get a good length of it. Uh, I mean, this will probably be more than we need, but I'm just going to cut a little extra so that I have, you know, some wire to actually work with. And now I just need to get the sheet thing off without damaging the wire underneath. There we go. 
So here I have two wires and there's a bit of thread in there as well to make it a bit more flexible. I'm going to, yeah, you really don't want this thicker part. So I literally just want just the wiring. So ideally, you know, I'm gonna just strip all this and can I pull this out? There we go. So now I just have the two wires. And just to make sure, I'll give them an extra twist to make sure that they don't try to fray apart. But yeah, those will do perfectly. So it's just a matter of, uh, of getting these tinned now. So a trick that I actually like to use, use good old gel flux. Get the iron heated up to pretty high of a temperature, like 750, something like that. And if I can get this stupid jar open, <laughs> there we go. And then just dip each end in. I'll do it for you guys. I haven't done this in quite a while. So basically you need some good old leaded solder. And my iron temp is up to about 700 now, so it's getting close. And just blob a bunch of solder onto your tip of your iron. There, you got a nice big blob. Dip this and then stick it in there. And it'll eventually start wicking its way up and you need quite actually a lot of solder. And there you can see, hopefully, that the end is now nice and tinned. And it's not gonna come apart now and it's it broke through the insulator. So it's actually pretty conductive. And you need to do that for both ends. And you can see all that smoke burning off. Do not breathe that. That's actually the enamel burning away. But yeah, you can see this one's done. And if you have too much exposed solder, you can always cut it off, trim it back. Um, I'm going to add actually quite a bit of extra strain relief wire so I don't have to worry about things being too tight and solder each wire. Now, the wires go straight through, so the left wire on the ribbon goes to the left pad and the right one goes to the right so just don't crisscross them um, otherwise the magnetic the, you know magnetization would be backwards which I I think that would affect uh, it being able to record or not pretty sure it will either way so I'm just gonna stick this on and heat up both try not to move as much as possible and a good idea after you do this, put a little, um, like, uh, kynar, or not kynar, put a little bit of, um, what do they call it, that yellow captain tape on there, just so it doesn't move. Because the weakest part of the this ribbon now is right where you solder to it. So I'm just going to bend those wires over. And never put... You know, if, if the overwrite head is exposed, never put it straight onto the table or anything like that. Put it back in the lid just so that it's protected. Now, I have all this extra wire. I'm going to actually loop it around and solder it. There we go. And just going to heat in these wires so that they're flat against the board. I mean, this is obviously overkill. You do not need this much wire. You only need enough just to get up there. Um, but yeah, it should be fine. Okay, so I found my captain tape. Now the age-old problem of finding where the heck the end is. Seriously, where's, where's the end? There has to be a beginning and there has to be an end. Here we go. Just going to cut off generous piece and stick one not covering the dock stick one right on here 
So these wires aren't going to move, and I'm going to stick one right across there as well. Should be good enough. There's a little bit of give in that, in that I didn't tape it like too taut or anything like that. So that should be fine. So let's just go. I'm going to screw this lid down, reassemble it enough uh, to test recording a disc over the line in or a mic, if I can find a mic. Uh, so give me a second to get this ready to safely test. Okay, so I'm ready to go. Got everything buttoned up. I have a disc that has junk data on it that I can write to or erase. I just realized I'm an idiot and I never connected the uh, display ribbon. Going to need to do that. And now we should be good to go. Battery in. Disc in. Write protect switch off. Display works still. Let's actually, let's make sure. Oops. Yeah, that's just whatever. So I should be able to go into edit, erase disk, all erase, yes. So now it should be writing to the talk. Table of contents, so the disk. Now, if you have a broken overwrite head, you can still erase a disk because that only uses the laser. It's when you actually go to record data um, that you need that overwrite head. Otherwise, it's just going to blank the disk out again. So let me grab something that I can... Um, record over either a microphone. I have one somewhere. Give me one sec. Okay, I swear I have like a nice Sony binaural mic that came with my um, my RH uh, Arch 10, but all I found was this crappy electric mic that I made. Um, and this obviously only records mono, but to both channels, I believe. So we're just going to run with that, I think. Uh, let's see, it's been a while since I've recorded over analog. So Mike is the red one. So let's just see if this will work at all. Yeah, I get this plugged in all the way. Testing, one, two, three. This is SJM4306. Hopefully this records, please. So it's... Uh, doing the talk edit now, I could see the um, the microphone sensitivity thing was actually moving, and it shows that I have most of the recording uh, remaining left. Now let's actually remove the disc, pull power, and see if it'll read the talk, if it did record successfully on this disc, and see if it'll play back. So if it says blank, then that means the overwrite head is still not working. So looks like the overwrite head is still not working. Darn it. So let me fiddle around with this and get it to work. Okay, I was actually a little bit mistaken. Uh, just due to the proximity to the overwrite head and kind of how large this was, I knew this was a dual package like NPN um, power transistor. And I thought this was to drive uh, the overwrite head. It's actually not. Only one of these is used. Uh, the one on the left here is actually not. It's connected, but it doesn't do anything. It's not the uh, gate signal is actually not driven. But this one here, I believe it's it runs... Uh, the rail over to this chip, and this is the like a uh, power supervisory chip. It's a switching uh, regulator, and I believe it's using that to generate the main um, like logic rail supply. Um, so I actually swapped that out and didn't change anything, which means this has nothing to do with the overhead. These two, however, are actually what drive. If you were um, when I looked up the service manual, I saw the traces. These two pads actually go over to these two chips here, and possibly. Maybe some of the circuitry is related. So I just, as a matter of course, swapped out uh, both of the chips from my uh, my spare board that I have here uh, just to test. I'm going to obviously keep these two chips and try not to mix them up. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to see now if I reassemble, does this work? If not, I'll try replacing this one and inspecting the circuitry because this 
this whole area here has to do with the overwrite uh, head drive. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that fixes it. Um, I might actually go through, the soldering isn't particularly tight pitch, but I might actually double check and look under the microscope to make sure because I kind of did this with the camera in the way, so it was kind of hard to tell. I think I got the placement all right though, uh, just using hot air to quickly get, that, that only took actually about like, not even six minutes to do to swap those two chips out with hot air. Whereas if I try to do it with a soldering iron, it would be a lot more difficult. It'd be more risky because of how many components are in the way. And it would take quite a bit longer to do it manually. So the hot air definitely saved me some time there. Anyway, let me get this all together and let's see if this all works now. Okay, so moment of truth again. Hopefully this will work. Still turns on, that's a good sign. Blank disc, protected. How is that protected? Oh, the... Uh, yeah, there's a little switch in the corner. It's not all the way pressed down because I forgot to tuck this bracket into there. So now it should read and allow me to write. There we go. So record about 10 seconds. Write the talk. Please work, please work. And... Just cycle it. Please detect. Nope. So it's not those two chips. Um, I might try just as a matter of course swapping uh, this guy. These are all transistors, by the way. They're they clearly have something to do with the like the drive. Um, I'm guessing the way that's wired, it's probably some kind of half bridge or maybe a full bridge, something like that. Uh, but clearly there's something wrong with um, the way that, I don't know, there must be some kind of damage or something because the overwrite head, as long as the drive circuit is all right, it should just work as long as it's electrically connected. And I already measured um, when I desolder these two wires, which I have wired to the top of the overwrite head, uh, when I measure them, they're electrically correct in terms of like the impedance uh, so it has to be something with the drive circuitry. Maybe there's some cold solder joints somewhere here. So I'm going to need to very carefully inspect everything just to make sure. So this is going to get quite a bit more tedious, unfortunately. Okay, so it does erase this. So that means that the burning laser is working. But I, no matter what I do, I can't get it to, uh, to actually record a disk to actually write data back onto a, a blank disk. So it is possible that, I don't know why, but the overwrite head itself isn't working. Now I have a mechanism from a, um, this is a lower end model in the same exact series. So uh, I believe the mechanics on this all work perfectly and it has an overwrite head soldered and ready to go. So I'm actually really tempted just to, to swap this board onto here so I have a feeling I did all this work soldering this wire only to find out that there's something else wrong. Maybe there is another tear in the ribbon. doesn't look like it, but or it could also be that the head itself is burned out or something. This is really weird because there's actually like multiple um, faults on this one unit itself, um, which <laughs> I guess that's just unlucky of me. But anyway, yeah, let me just swap the board onto this guy and see if this will work. So give me one second for that. Okay, so I've done a lot of random stuff. I swapped pretty much all the drive transistors and everything just to make sure that wasn't actually difficult to do with hot air. Uh, and when I measured this overwrite head, uh, it seemed to work. In turn, well, it seemed to read that there's you know an inductive coil and everything, so I figured it was all right. 
but it actually could be misaligned slightly or something else wrong with the head. And so all I did was I took from my MZN505, I took the body on that, uh, which has an intact overwrite head if I just open it real quick. So it actually has an, an intact overwrite head, but I had to do the same fix with the wires. And I swapped um, Chad's main board over with that. And I did a, a short 10 second recording on this. And with these wires installed, it actually does record. So that means it's the overwrite head on this. So I kind of have an interesting dilemma. So the the actual like uh, mechanical um, disc loading mechanism is slightly different between the 707 and the 505. And they're not compatible because uh, the 505 is missing this little bit here that presses on the uh, the disc lid sensor when it's closed. You can see here there's nothing, no piece of metal here, uh, because that's part of the door, the plastic door on the 505. So I can't just swap out and just leave everything like this and be good. So what I'm going to have to do uh, is I have two choices now. Either I swap just this head part, so just peel off the tape, swap them, and uh, I, I probably will have to slightly recalibrate, realign, or try and swap just this upper lid assembly part. But try to do that without touching anything else. So that's sort of where I'm at. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. I guess I'll try. Uh, if I can just switch this whole top part, that'll be fine. Because, well, I think the laser on this um, 505 scrap board that I have is starting to go because sometimes it gives me read errors. So I think what'll be the safest bet is just to swap the head. Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky, and I probably will have to realign it and recalibrate um, in terms of like the physical alignment. I shouldn't have to touch anything software side. But we'll try that and see how it goes. I think the first uh, matter of course is, since this head is knackered anyway, um, I nothing I can do, I, I can't get it to read. Even though when I measure the impedance or the resistance on these wires, it seems okay. It apparently isn't. Okay, so to get the head off, this is a good one. What I'm going to do is peel off the tape, get it ready to go and let's see I'm going to have to pe start peeling very slow and careful at this point because there's some tape double-sided tape okay okay i just loosened it so now the head is just sort of swinging there so I could undo this screw and crack the glue. That'll mess with the alignment even worse. So it's easiest just to take off these two screws on the bottom. And then you could actually just carefully lift the head out and slide it off the laser mount. Now the head is just floating there. Now it's just a matter of pushing out the plastic, there's a mid-frame part, and just getting it out just enough that you can slide this part out. Being very careful of the ribbon. There we go. So now the overwrite head is safely out. So I'm done with this now. Now it's just a matter of doing the exact opposite and getting it into the old frame. Make sure the ribbon does not catch. It has to go underneath. Okay, there. And now what we are going to do, this is pretty nerve-wracking, I'm not gonna lie. Just 
just gonna lift it right over so that it goes into the keys on the back of the laser sled there and then we're just gonna grab the two screws just snug up we're not doing super tight or anything like that they don't have to be super tight but let's see and then we're going to just pull the laser out there and basically align the um the ribbon roughly to where the the original adhesive was it doesn't have to be perfect just make sure it's in there and just press the tape down so that should be good enough and the alignment looks like it's still good looks like it's right over so what i'm going to do is just reassemble everything now and before i put the back on just retest uh, that it still records um, with this new in air quotes overwrite head so give me one sec on that okay so we're all back together it went pretty uneventfully what i'm going to do is make sure that this little catch is in there so that it holds the board in. I haven't screwed the board uh, fully back in, but I'm just going to see, make sure it reads. Okay, so did read it. It's playing it right now, in fact. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to erase this disc again to make sure that the laser is still good. It's doing a talk edit. Now it's blank, eject, recycle it, should still be blank, record, it's recording from the line, there's nothing plugged in clearly, let it run for about 10 seconds, it's doing a table of contents edit, finished, recycle, if it reads it now then that means the overhead worked. <laughs> it sees it. I can play it. It is playing. So what I'm going to do now is uh, re-erase the disc and record using my really janky uh, electric microphone setup. So just going to plug it into the red jack here. This I soldered. Uh, it's basically mono, but I soldered it to both channels, I believe. So it'll have the same audio on both channels. So let's just testing one, two, three. Hopefully you can see that microphone bar is moving. Uh, hopefully this is the last time I have to tinker with this MZN 707 and hopefully it's fully repaired. Three things I repaired on this unit. Uh, the button board wasn't working, so I replaced it with a spare. The uh, headphone amp was, uh, was I had some cold solder joints on it, so I reflowed it. And finally, I ended up having to replace the overwrite head. I thought it was the circuitry, so I ended up just as a matter of course, because I had replacements, I replaced all the drive transistors in the overwrite head circuit and eventually found that the actual overwrite head itself was uh, non-functional, so I replaced it with uh, a spare that I luckily happened to have. Anyway, hopefully this works. I will listen to this back and make sure that it works. Okay, so it is saving now. And it's doing a talk edit. And it's done. So just remove that mic. Still has it. It was about a 50 second recording, so it's definitely seeing it. Let me grab a... Um, like a Bluetooth speaker or something I can plug this into and play it because this is obviously not copyrighted, so you should be able to listen to it just fine. Here I have my handy dandy uh, Arch Cheer Bluetooth speaker. Hopefully the battery is not dead. There we go. Plug it into the headphone jack. Hopefully you can see that microphone bar is moving. Uh, hopefully this is the last time I have to tinker with this MZN 707. And hopefully it's fully repaired. 
three things I repaired on this unit. So yeah, it works. So there, I fixed the last and final fault, uh, which was actually being the override head. Now, I don't know. Um, it actually could have been uh, some of the drive transistors were damaged as well for some odd reason. I don't know. Uh, so I, I've replaced them. They're, they're from a unit, uh, an obviously secondhand unit, but that was fully functional um, at some point. So I'm pretty sure they're fine. If they work now, they're going to work pretty much forever. Uh, the original ones I have just up here in the corner, they probably all do work still. I'm just going to stick them back on with hot air onto my uh, other board. I might actually, I lied, I might actually solder wires to them and use a transistor uh, tester just to make sure that they aren't blown. But I, I'm actually pretty sure now that it was just the overwrite head. It had absolutely nothing to do uh, with the... I'm just going to stick a little bit of Captain Tape, by the way, uh, just on the solder connections. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it was just the uh, overwrite head wasn't working. But yeah, audio works, display works, all buttons work. Uh, now it can uh, record. So I'm going to speed reassemble this and give it a little bit of testing with uh, different recorded discs. And I'm probably going to plug into the computer and make sure I can re record over NetMD. I'm not going to bore you guys with that. Uh, but if you don't hear anything more at the end of this video, that means that this is fully repaired and fully working. Definitely going to run it through its paces and make sure it continues working longer term uh, before I send this back to my friend. But anyway, uh, let's just get on with reassembly then. Okay, and everything I always do, as soon as I reassemble everything, give it a quick test again. Just to make sure Murphy does not get me. And there we go, we have two tracks still. So yeah, I'm gonna call this one a win, a massive win. I was able to fix uh, three problems in one um, and it's fully functional now. Could use a bit of a clean, but um, in terms of functionality, uh, it's fully functional now. So yeah. Like I said, I'm going to run this through its paces for a couple of days just to make sure it continues staying working, that there's nothing um, temperamental about it before sending it back to uh, Chad. Because Chad will end up using this, hopefully, for another many years of recording music on this. And I want to make sure that this isn't going to break again easily. Anyway, uh, I guess huge thanks to the several parts mini disc units. Uh, as I was saying, huge thanks to the several parts units that I use <laughs> different parts from in order to fix this one guy. Uh, lucky that I had um, quite a number of parts, and there's still quite a number of good parts left on these boards that I, I could use to fix my other MDs, uh, mini disc recorders, if anything ever happens. That's one good thing about Sony portables. They all tend to use very similar parts amongst... Uh, different model ranges, even between certain generations. So the fact that I kept all these other parts from other broken mini disc uh, recorders was definitely a huge bonus um, that allows me to fix um, otherwise what would otherwise be unfixable uh, mini disc portables. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to see me do more of this kind of stuff, I can try. But like I said, uh, a lot of these MD portables now are getting like really rare and expensive. So might maybe not exactly related to this, but maybe I can tinker more with um, fixing portable CD players and like MP3 players and that kind of stuff. If you guys are interested, I always keep my eye out on eBay for deals. 
but it's getting a little bit harder recently, but you know, I always, I'm always up for a good deal if I can find one. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.